Welcome to Talking Peace with the Western New York Peace Center, being recorded at Think Twice Radio in the home of the future, also the home of our friend and producer, Richard Wicca. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, WBNY and Buff State. Thankfulness is such a key element, and people start off every, the indigenous people start all of their their events with the words that um, should come before or all, all others, which basically look at the the creation, the world, and um, and go through all the the elements in thankfulness for those elements for the, the plants and animals, for the for the Mother Earth, for the Creator, and and for the love that animates it all. And for that, we are I'm I am so grateful. And um, actually, in 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 uh, on Haudenosaunee country, people say Nyawe, and then the, uh, the people say Nyo or Je. So if you want to say Nyo, Nyo, Nyawe, thank you. So I'm especially thankful that we have a wonderful group of guests here to talk tonight about a number of things. Um, I I could say you know the the wonderful and the terrible. Um, which are always intimately connected anyway. So we're going to talk um, about the work that each one of our, our wonderful guests is, are doing and also talk about um, Craig McIver's award that he's getting at the Western New York Peace Center annual dinner, as well as to talk about the issues that he's been working on and that we've all been working on around Gaza, around the flagrant violations of international law around the need to to stop arming Israel and and really strengthen our, our, our and 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 our our international organizations that abide by international law so we've got a lot to cover so uh just going around as the Haudenosaunee do I'll say um I'll, I'll start with Rob Jureski hi Rob hello <laughs> Um, should I introduce myself? Oh, oh, you can. Yes, you can introduce yourself. Sure. Okay. So I'm I'm Robert Jureski. Uh, I live in New York City, and I'm uh, a, one of the volunteer coordinators of Code Pink's efforts in New York City to um, to pressure countries to um, isolate Israel and to sanction Israel uh, until it behaves, until it stops. Um, violating international law, um, wantonly murdering uh, Palestinians, um, starving the entire population, et cetera. So all the horrible things that we have unfortunately witnessed it do in the last year, um, we're trying to get countries to um, stop that. So that's that's who I am. And that's why, well, and you you do all kinds of work for for move the money and all kinds of related and well, they're all related to peace and justice. So we're grateful for you, Rob. Uh, Rob, thank you. Red. And another lawyer, our uh, wonderful um, upcoming stellar media uh, activist award winner, um, Craig McIver. Now, Craig has. I, I, I let me just at least start introducing you with the, the fact that there's just too many things to say about all the wonderful work Craig has done over the years from over from as a human rights uh, expert, international law expert, um, uh, uh, senior senior um, official at the, at the UN um, for over 30 years. And who quit based on the, all the failings o over what's going on in Gaza and Palestine? And uh, he's a writer. He's an uh, uh, he's an author. He is just a clear thinker. He's written some powerful, compelling things. Sp uh, speaks so powerfully and compellingly. And we're so grateful to have you on, Craig. Vicky, so nice to be with you again. So nice to be with all of you again. I'm very happy to be here on this station in particular. Oh, well, we're very excited to have you on again. And actually, all of you have been on the show. I would say friend of the show in every case. And especially, last but not least, Kathy Kelly, 
very much a friend of the show, I, even though I know the timing is not good for you. But um, we're uh, and and friend of the Western New York Peace Center. I mean, so when we talk about the annual dinner, I mean, you have some real experience there too. So uh, Cassie Kelly, world renowned peace and justice activist, who's had you know it was voices for creative non well first it was voices in the wilderness and voices for creative nonviolence. Now the chair of um, of uh, World Beyond War and does so many does so many things for so many groups for Afghans for for Gazans for just so many groups that need help have gotten so much so much help from Kathy so welcome Kathy. You know, I'm not hearing you. I don't know. Maybe she's there, muted. There you go. Are you muted by chance? Try again. I'm not muted, but maybe... Oh, um, there you are. No, it's good. We can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay. And I wasn't able to hear Craig when he was speaking, but... Um, oh. <laughs> Well, I, I, I hope Richard can solve whatever's happening. And uh, meanwhile, I hope that this is all taping well so that we can hear all of it. Um, so, Cassie, thank you for coming so much. Mm -hmm. So, so um, and then uh, as a first go around, if we could just start with on the topics of, well, how am, uh, I'm going to say on the topic of stellar media, which is what Craig is getting an award for, and um, and international law. When we think about those items um, and how they support Palestine, if you want to, each of you just mention a, a, a value or two that you think of in that connection. So you already did some of that, Rob, but if you just want to just pick a value, a related value or two. So I'm 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 not familiar uh, with Stellar Media, um, Vicky. I know that it's like an important um, award um, that um, Craig is getting, um, but I, I don't know um, much about the background. So I, um, how do how I would relate that to international law? I, I don't know. Uh, I, no. I mean, the, yeah. I would just say you know just what you think media. Think about oh, what, oh, media. what value we need to think of when we think of media and international, in oh, either, either or both. They're not, not necessarily. Sure. Yeah, right. of course. I mean, I mean, media has been, I, I mean, to me, like, you know, transparency, accountability, uh, you know, it's it provides a window to uh, far, far away places where our tax money is uh, doing terrible things, our bombs our um our supposed allies um uh so it's um th i'm talking about the u.s government um but media serves um those important uh, values of of um holding uh accountable the, the those who are violating international law so right you're so right well put thank you rob and craig yeah, I think that was a great uh, a great start, and I think I would just add on the kind of values connected to international law side that, that you know international human rights law says that free expression, freedom of information are fundamental human rights guarded by international law, and we know that um, because as we've spoken about before that the genocide happening in Palestine could not be sustained without the support of the United States government, and a part of the strategy to sustain that U.S. government support is to make sure that the people in the United States don't know what's actually happening on the ground. And part of that happens on the ground in Gaza through the murder of Palestinian journalists targeted by the Israelis one after another, uh, setting a world record for the number of journalists that have been uh, have been killed for attacks and seizures on Palestinian journalists in Gaza and in the West Bank, uh, uh, journalist uh, institutions and facilities and all of the occupied territories through also the banning of foreign journalists. Uh, to make sure that the story doesn't get out that way. So you keep the foreign journalists out, you ban Al Jazeera, and you kill the, the local Palestinian journalists. Um, you impose a very strict military censorship 
system at the same time. So this is all on the sort of the uh, from the ground, you know, the sending end as well. You do all you can to block the internet and electricity and so on to um, prevent things from uh, from from going out. Uh, you establish a, a, a transnational program of propaganda, as the Israelis have done, uh, enforce it domestically, and then use influence in the West to make sure that that essentially is happening in the West uh, as well. Um, we've seen as well the fabrication of uh, atrocities, uh, especially on October 7th, created by Israel out of whole cloth. And then, you know, for example, the 40 beheaded babies that never were uh, in order to create a dehumanization of the Palestinians and a justification for genocide and crimes against humanity um, uh, against them. You know, this is all a part of that information um, uh, strategy on the ground. And then beyond that, you use uh, organizations in the West to pressure journalists and media companies so that they don't publish reports that are critical of uh, of of Israel, you um, you have media corporations in the West, so-called mainstream media corporations that are both ideologically the owners are both ideologically committed to the project of uh, Israeli impunity, but they also have important economic interests in maintaining that that particular story. And so you see all of the major networks and newspaper publications in the West uh, blacking out the reality of the genocide on the ground and disseminating propaganda for uh, for Israel. All of this in violation of these international human rights guarantees of freedom of information, freedom of expression, um, uh, and so on. And all of them knowingly disseminating this dis disinformation, propaganda, justifying war crimes, crimes against humanity, the reports in this country that consistently dehumanize Palestinians, uh, block out information on the genocide in, in the West. Um, you know, these are all, you know, it, in the case of genocide, uh, Vicky, I would say there are, as I've written, there are precedents in international law for holding media figures accountable for incitement to genocide and complicity in genocide because they knowingly disseminated these dehumanizing and insightful uh, and distorted messages to encourage the continuation of the carnage um, on the ground. And they could be, as they have been, subject to legal prosecutions as they were in Nuremberg uh, and as they're somewhere in the Rwanda tribunals uh, as well. But even if it doesn't rise to that level, you can see civil actions for damages. You can see uh, social movements and campaigns holding these companies uh, accountable by affecting their bottom lines, unsubscribing, uh, and so on. And I just to finish this thought, as I, I always do, never talk about the media in this way without saying that the last thing we want to do is to erode free speech guarantees, because we know very well that free speech guarantees usually protect uh, us the most, those of us who are not in power, those of us who are challenging the orthodoxies, who are challenging power, challenging the government, um, uh, and we don't want to erode those because they will come first, not for the New York Times or the Washington Post or Fox News. Um, they'll come for us. So we need to make sure that as we challenge this disinformation uh, um, and these dehumanizing and insightful reporting by Western media, that we don't do anything to erode the free speech guarantees that are so important for um, for all of us. So all of this you know, is something that is codified in international human rights law. It is something for which there are precedents of holding people accountable. But in the end, as always, action and accountability in this realm falls on us, on, on people, on movements, on civil society, because if we're waiting either for the government of the U.S. Uh, or an international organization to save us, uh, that salvation is not coming. It's really up to us. No, Craig, you just gave a perfect uh, illustration of why you're getting that the Stellar Media Award. So if you want to know what the Stellar Media Award about, it's about people who are able to um, to spread that mess, those messages, those many vitally, critically important messages and in so many arenas as you do. So we'll get to more of that. Thank you so much, Craig. And Kathy, um, what what are some values that you want to mention in terms of media and international law in today's issues? Well, I'm so sorry not to have heard a word that Craig said. 
Um, and I don't want to repeat what's already been said, so I'll pass. Thank you. Well, um, okay. So you you don't want to mention for? I mean, I will. I'll have to make sure that you get. We'll we'll make sure you get this copy. But what you you might um, think of when you think of international law or media, some of the values that we need to think of. Well, I think it's been so telling each time there's been a national debate that the issues related to international law, foreign policy are sort of shuttled to the end if they're mentioned at all. And we find that the United States people are woefully undereducated around issues that are so important, especially because it's our policies that have so horribly brutalized people all around the world. And um when I uh, think about the possibility of ever paying reparations for the suffering we caused in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in the West Bank, in Gaza now, um, you know, it, it, people are, again, so acutely unaware. It was very impressive to me that the student movement last spring was as uh, motivated and competent as people were. But again, you know, I don't think the media is covering the ways in which the student movement has been uh, abused, really, by uh, short-sighted, narrow-minded uh, leaders of universities. So, you know, some people had said, well, it's not so important what happens in November, it's what happens in September. And we really need those student movement uh, activists. But I'm afraid the the, uh, they've been shortchanged by people leading their universities. Well, thank you, Kathy. I'm so glad that you did provide an answer because you have your own special nuances that you put in there that are so important. And there are a lot of them about, which again is a, a theme in, in everything that, that you all said is about our responsibility. So, um, and when I think of values, I, I usually mention truth and love. That They're still in there. They're absolutely critical to what we need and what we need to do. And part of it, in terms of media, is truth. You know, so truth in media, not the spinning and the lying and the, and the ignoring things that we've seen that, that each of you mentioned in so many uh, really eloquent ways. And... <clears throat> And it, as far as love, I mean, I think of that phrase that uh, justice is what love looks like in public. And I'm going to say international law is what love looks like, or at least, you know, respect looks like in in the legal field. If only we didn't ignore it or be the, amongst the worst offenders or the worst offender, because I still believe that the greatest purveyor of violence in the world is our own government, as you were uh, mentioning. So, so uh, I'm just very grateful. I, I, I don't. I, I usually forget to introduce myself. So, uh, Craig, thank you for for mentioning my name. And I will just say that I've reclaimed my teenage nickname of Victory, because we need the real victories. And I want to segue before we go further into the. Well, I, I guess I, I I just want to mention the the Peace Center annual dinner um, before we get too far into some of the other things because Craig is going to be recognized at the Peace Center annual dinner and he so deeply deserves it and the Peace Center annual dinner is it our major its major fundraiser of the year and Kathy has been the um, has uh, been a wonderful keynote speaker a, a number of times and has uh, come to the rescue for us at different times. And um, you you have such a gift for, for giving human examples to the things that you're working on, the people that you come across in your work, in your international work for human rights and, and for just caring, caring for people in, in courageous, very courageous ways that, and, and so consistent. So, Maybe if you just want to say a few words about, I'll just say, first of all, that it is on November 15th 
um, people, if they go to WNYPeace.org, there's a link to buy tickets and there still are tickets and uh, it'll be a vegan dinner, Sunshine Vegan that does such a great job. Um, but the biggest thing is it's this very diverse and um, uh, uh, really a, 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 a just a, a gathering of the beloved community. So, and, and Kathy, you have led it off for us so many times. So do you want to say a word or two about that? Well, the last time that I was there, I remember being so happy to see a table full of very um, bright-eyed and eager young Yemeni women. And uh, their voices ought to be heard. You know, I think follow the young people everywhere. But particularly, I guess it was Salman Rushdie said that those who are forcibly displaced by war are the shining shards that reflect the truth. And, uh, you know, the, the Western New York Peace Center has been uh, superb at giving a seat at the table, more or less, to many of the people who've been forcibly displaced and whose stories ought to guide us and be be, be our moral compass. I, I was so happy to meet those young and many women, and I wish them well now. I wonder what it means for young people from Yemen to see their country standing alone again uh, right. trying to stand up to uh, the desecration of Gaza and the West Bank. Uh, you know, I think the means you use will determine the end you get. And I don't want to be a cheerleader for uh, bomb throwers, bomb droppers. I, but I do believe that Yemen has been punished again and again for taking a stance which uh, has shown a lot more courage and spine with regard to challenging international officials. So I hope those young people are are hearing from the adults in their lives that uh, that, that they should respect their country for all the um, the justice that it has stood up for. You're so right. And, and that is a very um, uh, beautifully put and, and very eloquent point about the, um, the courage of Yemen and those the courage of those young women who also presented their case to um, then our then congressperson um, Brian Higgins, or oh, actually he didn't even come. He uh, anyway, I don't want to go there. But they they presented it to his office or his person who who uh, his aide that he assigned. But they showed such courage. And actually, we have a young woman, a uh, Cayuga young woman, who's been working for the indigenous rights um, and as a former peace jammer. And she's getting the Emerging Leaders Award this year. So it, it will be excellent. You'll meet her, Craig. So you're, you're the one who will be there to meet her. Um, so anyway, enough on the dinner. I just want to make that point. It will be great food and great spirit of of solidarity and, and 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 devotion, really, to making the changes that we need to make. So, I think my my um, I don't know what. Oh, here, I think I froze for a minute. Did I? I, I did too. Oh, what? It didn't seem like that to me. Oh, good. Either okay. of you. Yeah. Well, anyway, we're going to keep on because we don't. We're not going to worry about te technical difficulties unless we have to. So anyway, so let us move on to um, to what's going on in the UN and and on the ground in in Palestine and Israel, for that matter. Um, although we know that the Israelis are, you know. Anyway, I'll I'll just leave it to the each of you in turn, what you want to share about what you know, what you see, or what you what we want to see about um, the situation, the, the onslaught on Gaza right now and on Palestine. So Rob, why don't we start with you and, and, and the Code Pink um, and, and allies and United Allies um, World Court campaign. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, what we see in Israel a few days ago was a uh, a vote in the Knesset 
ninety uh, percent of the parliamentarians uh, voted to ban UNRWA's operations uh, from Israel, which I think they believe means the occupied territories as well, because they're not interested in the uh, decision that was given by the World Court and numerous General Assembly resolutions that say that the occupied territories are not um, Israel and that it's occupying those uh, lands illegally. Um, but this is this is really important, uh, a really important vote. And I think it, it's uh, had a, a pretty strong, there's been a response in Europe. I mean, it's never as, as strong as we need. It's not the it's not the um, the courageous actions of um, the the Yemenis who see a genocide announced and um, warn that uh, Israel has to be isolated and then take action to isolate Israel because it's carrying out that genocide. But it is nevertheless um, outrage at this vote in Europe uh, among some quarters uh, because in part, I mean, UNRWA is the lifeline it's described as the lifeline for palestinians it's not only the lifeline for food and and uh and education um but it's also the repository of uh history the, the, it, it is uh they collect um archival materials for preserving palestinian uh history um but what's important in this in this context and in what uh, Israel's declared intention has been from um, from October uh, to starve the entire population of uh, Palestine in in Gaza um, is that this violates the um, among other things uh, the, the provisional measures uh, that were issued in March by the World Court uh, in response to South Africa's um, uh, application there. Um, and the provisional measure was to um, that Israel must ensure the uh, provision of aid from all sources at scale um, to address the humanitarian crisis that the World Court recognized existed there. And in their in their original application in December, the, um, the South Africa um, they they pointed out and they they quoted uh general secretary guterres who said that you know a ceasefire is necessary for humanitarian aid to get to the people of of gaza um but uh, even short of a ceasefire the world court um uh, in its provisional measures declared that uh, basically unra um has to be allowed to do uh, what it is there to do, uh, protect Palestinians by providing them with food. Uh, um, and and they've been denied that. And now Israel has, its government has declared that they're banned. So I think it's, um, that's what's happening in Israel. Um, they're like, they're doubling down on the genocide. Um, and, and, and I think there are parties in Europe, um, I think Norway, uh, among them, uh, but I think also Spain have like responded strongly, um, and they need to respond by isolating Israel by stopping military aid from putting into ports in their countries and from um, being delivered by planes from their countries or planes over their countries, um, and uh, that that's what's happening in Israel. Um, I don't. I want to leave time for other people to to speak about what's happening elsewhere but we're at at the un code pink is um we are uh sending letters to uh key un uh member states to urge them to uh to impose sanctions arms embargoes sanctions um and uh, you know, uh, to form a tribunal, the General Assembly could form an international tribunal to try Israel for uh, the, the war crimes that it is um, committing. Um, there are a range of asks. I mean, the most urgent, obviously, are to force Israel to stop starving the Palestinians because the conditions there are horrendous. They, you know, the the bombing of hospitals, of schools being used to house refugees, just the 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 gutting of the territory uh, and and 
the massacres that we hear about daily, um, there have to be forceful actions by the powerful countries, European countries uh, that are the number one trading partner or the, the European Union is with Israel and then Turkey that is delivering oil to uh, to Israel. Uh, Jordan that is still trading with Israel. All these countries whose leaders say, you know, things condemning what's happening, but have yet to take the forceful action that they can take and that they should take and that I think that they are legally obligated to take to force Israel to stop. Um, so we'll, we'll be s sending letters to those key countries and uh, asking for meetings with them, but also demonstrating outside of their missions and hopefully getting media attention to domestic outrage where they are experiencing, like in every in, in most countries in the world, a, a majority of their populations disgusted by what we've all witnessed over the last year that are mobilized and forcing, trying to force their government to listen to their people. Um, so that's what we hope that will happen, uh, we'll, we'll be working on in the next weeks. Well, thank you so much for that work. Um, when I've been... Uh, done any of uh, some pieces of that work with you all it's uh hugely important and 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 uh very inspiring when some of the countries like um spain or colombia certainly south africa above all you know are doing something at least some are doing something um, um but also when we're you're talking about local um protests, I can't help also making a little parenthetical talk, uh, ask to Craig, um, if you could just on the same topic, you know, tell us about that. But before you do, just tell a little bit about the protest today in uh, in uh, Western New York that I was very, 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 very sorry to miss. So if you would. No, it was it was fantastic. I, I'm hoping Kathy can hear me by now. Can you hear him? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. no. Okay. It's funny uh, that the, she can only. Yeah, it's only me that she can't hear, and everyone else is fine. Uh, so I don't know. But it is. We'll, but we'll send you the whole tape, Kathy. You'll. you'll, you'll yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, the, the demonstration today was terrific. It was in front of the offices of uh, Senator Gillibrand uh, and Congressman Kennedy to present uh, the petition to him that was led by Jewish Voice for Peace. Um, a large number of people there that the JVP managed to turn out. I was there. It was a great pleasure to, to speak with uh, all the sisters and brothers who, who turned out um, for that to demand a very basic demand of these elected officials that they respect American law, that they respect international law, uh, that they respect the rulings of the International Court of Justice, and that they cease providing arms to the genocide that's happening in uh, in Palestine. So it was a great turnout. I think it was very empowering for the folks who were there, and a small delegation from amongst us was able to go upstairs and present these petitions in person to the staffs of uh, of the respective offices, obviously not being received by um, by by the representatives uh, themselves, and uh, a lot of support on the street. People waving and beeping horns, nothing negative, all positive. Uh, I think gradually people are beginning to be educated about these these matters. Yeah. Right. So that's that was the demonstration today, yeah. And then more at, at, as far as what's going on in the UN and on the international. Uh, uh, for, and I just need to parenthetically say the articles that you have written that are just so compelling, concise, fit, beautifully written, and so clear about the obligations and we know the illegal acts that are going on in this country by our arms manufacturers and Kathy when we get to you I definitely want you to talk about the merchants of death and how that's associated but anyway but Craig if you want to just yeah uh yeah in, uh, well, that, that's us. the work that's, that, that's the work you know we're up against this wall of propaganda this blackout and so on and and these writings are just meant to sort of unpack debunk uh, some of the propaganda and the misrepresentations that people are spoon fed by corporate media in particular, and then to equip them with facts, which 
are very short uh, at hand if you're living in the West. Uh, law, international law in particular, but also the logic of these things so people are equipped to first think critically about what they're being told and then secondly to be able to to push back. And I think Rob is right to start with uh, underscoring Israel's recent move on UNRWA, the UN Relief and Work Agencies for Palestine Refugees, um, uh, and its decision, Israel's decision in its Knesset, its parliament, uh, to ban UNRWA, not just from Israel, but from the occupied territories. Um, this is a campaign by Israel that goes back decades. Uh, from the very beginning, Israel has used every dirty trick in the book to try to attack UNRWA. Because in Gaza, for example, the majority of people who are living in Gaza, those families are refugees and the families of refugees who were forced out uh, in 47, 48, 49 in the original Nakba, the original genocidal ethnic cleansing of, of Palestine. And they have held on to their refugee uh, status as tightly as they've held on to the actual keys of their homes inside what is now called Israel, where other folks are living now. Uh, having having pushed them out. And so Israel has always realized that UNRWA represents one, it represents this kind of chain of the Palestinian people to their indigenous land uh, and to their status as refugees and therefore their right to return home. And as Rob said, it represents a lifeline that's keeping them alive so they can stay, for example, in Gaza without perishing because UNRWA makes that possible um, as well. It's mandated by the General Assembly. Israel has no authority over UNRWA or to dissolve it or to keep it out. In doing so, Israel is in breach of a number of its international legal obligations. Uh, Rob mentioned, you know, the provisional orders, uh, uh, provisional uh, measures of the International Court of Justice in the genocide case, but there are a number of treaty obligations that they would be in breach of if they were to implement this, this decision as well. And finally, they have no authority whatsoever over UN personnel, UN assets, a UN presence in East Jerusalem, in the West Bank, in the Gaza Strip. So they have legal obligations to cooperate with UNRWA inside of Israel, but they have no authority at all um, to, to purport to ban the operations of UNRWA from the, occupied, uh, from the occupied territories. They do so because they realize it's the last lifeline. And in the most current genocide, you can watch how systematically Israel has worked to make the conditions in Gaza less and less habitable to ensure the destruction of the Palestinian people in Gaza. Remember, Gaza was already a prison before October 7th of last year. <coughs> and because they had been falsely made dependent on humanitarian aid, because they've been imprisoned by Israel, they have been relying on 500 trucks a day of humanitarian aid just to survive in pre-October of last year levels. And those were levels where the caloric intake, uh, health, and, and well-being, and so on, indicators were extremely low because even those 500 trucks a day were inadequate. Since that time, all of Gaza has been destroyed. Its food uh, production uh, capacities, its food storage, its water, its sanitation, the houses, the bakeries, the agricultural fields. So everything has been destroyed there. So if they needed 500 trucks a day, before the current wave of genocide, it's difficult to calculate what they would need uh, in the current context. And the only thing standing between them and total destruction was UNRWA. And so now Israel has moved to, re to, to get rid of that last barrier to the genocide of the Palestinian people in Gaza, even as it has upscaled its genocidal assaults on Palestinians in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, over the course of these uh, of these most recent months um, in particular. So what we're really seeing is this final wave of the genocide by this government in Israel, supported, by the way, by its Supreme Court, by its Knesset, by its media, by large numbers of clergy, and by the vast majority of the, of the general public. Now, what's really striking here, Victoria, as well, is that... Um, you know, it's not just attacking UNRWA and the way it has. Israel has the world record for the murder of UN staff. It has killed hundreds of UNRWA and other UN um, uh, staff members. It has attacked 
uh, countless UN schools, UN clinics, UN facilities, UN convoys, UN aid depots. Um, uh, it has slandered and lied about the UN. It has used its influence with Western allies to block funding to UN programs. In other words, it has breached on every conceivable level its obligations under international law, its obligations to the UN, and it has made the UN an enemy, which it has called a terrorist organization. In spite of this, Israel still has a seat in the General Assembly of the United Nations. And so that's why Rob and other activists have also been looking at how to make sure, uh, as South Africa was during the, the heyday of apartheid, that Israel is suspended from its seat in the General Assembly and hopefully subsequently from its role in other UN agencies. It is inconceivable to me that uh, 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 an entity such as this, which attacks the UN on so many levels, which has, which has kidnapped, arrested, and tortured countless UN staff members, still sits in the General Assembly and uses that seat to attack the UN as well. So uh, if the UN is unwilling to defend itself, it falls again on all of us to mobilize to make sure that we defend international law and international institutions and then hold them accountable for doing their job. Sheesh, what, what, it is just so, so dire, so dire. And to be, to be uh, clear, so uh, with all the international law that is being transgressed right now by Israel, um, in, uh, to do with the bombing and, and, and the killing of, of innocent civilians, of proportionality, of, 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 uh, journalists and uh, UN workers and medical and humanitarian work workers is is it all is it also true that per the world court the settlements are illegal and need to be disbanded and the and the um and the the occupation is illegal and needs to be ended and what to speak of the the um, the the, the the land that has been systematically uh, encroached upon and encroached upon. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. The, the International Court of Justice has found that the occupation and all manifestations of that occupation are entirely unlawful, which means that every settlement, every settler, every soldier, and as I've said, every Israeli bicycle on a road in the occupied territories is unlawful and must be removed, that the apartheid wall must be dismantled, that the Palestinians must be compensated, that those forced out must be allowed to return. Uh, and not not just ordering, um, uh, finding that with regard to Israel, but also finding the legal obligation on all states, including the government of the United States, to cut off any support to those unlawful activities completely and to use whatever power and influence they have to totally and immediately end that uh, that occupation. So, um, you know, the, the problem here, of course, is the 76-year-old problem of Israeli impunity underwritten by the West, especially the United Kingdom, the United States, Germany, but most especially the government of the United States, which ensures that international law does not apply to Israel. And that's why we find ourselves in a situation where we are getting closer and closer, where we have gone through genocide, we're getting closer and closer to total destruction, we're heading into a regional war um, uh, uh, of, of a kind that we've never seen before with very powerful states, including Israel, which is a, a state that is has massive stockpiles of nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons, Israel does, uh, and then powerful states like Iran and others with close allies, including Russia, China, and others, um, uh, untold destabilization for countries across the region. We're heading toward this for one reason and one reason only, which is that that Israel's Western allies, beginning with the United States, have decided that Israeli impunity is more important than the survival of the rest of us. Well, we can't have it. We can't have it. So, and it's totally illegal, immoral, and and foolhardy, and doesn't even help the Israelis in the end, of course, because they're more and more unsafe. But so, Cassie, Cassie, please. Uh, first of all, I apologize for our technical difficulties where you can't hear Craig. So we'll make sure you get to hear him later on.
But um, if you would uh, speak a little bit about um, the the um, Merchants of Death Tribunal and all the work that you've been doing on that and how that relates to all of this about, uh, the, well, the situation in in the past in Gaza and and um, the occupied territories. Well, it's been very telling being on um, Zoom calls for organizing purposes with people from Palestine and Gaza and to hear them talk during the call about immediate attacks that they're enduring. And one young man said, this is the final solution. We're facing the final solution. And this group that I've been meeting with is planning what's called a um, global solidarity for peace in Palestine. And really, they, they, they've they drawn their energy and incentive directly from what Rob and the Code Pink people in New York and Craig and other professors have offered. They, they, they're placing a lot of hope in the possibility that the uh, member states of the United Nations could unseat Israel, could um, be able to impose sanctions. And it was so telling to me also that 2,000 uh, people from Israel living within Israel or in other parts of the world signed an open letter saying, within Israel, there is not the capacity to change that government, please. They were begging the international organizations and the countries to impose sanctions and you know, basically consequences, teeth on Israel in order to stop Israel from you know, its own suicidal actions and the horrific, horrific uh, suffering that's being imposed on others. So November 3rd, there will be a conference call, a follow-up conference call with this group uh, featuring Raji Sorani and Anne Wright and a woman named Amal Siam from Gaza who will give testimony. And that will be at six o'clock Palestine time with the clocks changing in different parts of the world. It's a little bit hard to posit right. exactly the other times, but I hope people will join this call and then go to the World Beyond War website where you can find a letter that will go to the permanent missions to the United Nations. Uh, and and sign that letter. As many people as can sign that letter would contribute towards some heft to then bring a delegation to meet, perhaps with uh, Secretary General Guterres. Uh, Merchants of Death War Crimes Tribunal has um, been quite grateful for the testimony of so many people and for the input of the jurors, and will be uh, post-U.S. election wrapping things up. And um, we, we do hope to bring all of those recommendations that have been made to the International Court of Justice and to the ICC as well. But you know, to me, the most important recommendations are the ones that say reparations ought to be paid. And I don't want to see anyone go to prison. I've been in prison in federal prison for you know a year at one spot and three months. I don't want, but I want people to be rehabilitated. And I I believe it's incredibly important that the people who are profiteers, who are making so many billions of dollars by developing, storing, and selling ways to blow other people up, be put out of business. And that's something that historically in the United States, people did clamor for at the end of World War I when they realized that industrialized slaughter had happened. So let's hope that um, people will come to their senses and stop treating the uh, merchants of death as though they somehow were scions and uh, moral compasses for our society. So far from it, so very far from it. I, I, I want to say you have been so eloquent. One of the things that is very clear is that it is big business. So the the war the the, the arms manufacturers are not going to be, they won't have um, the markets for their wares unless there's wars going on. So they have a vested interest and they are very frank in some of their letters. This is great for our bottom line, they say. Well, it's, 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 it's not great for, back to what that reason I bring up a victory, it's the real victory everyone wins. The others, the companion, saying to that is 
there is no violent solution. So it will never be a solution bombing your way into whatever you think is a solution. And I, and many Israelis, I hope that I, at least it's, I, I know that some Israelis understand that. And some Jewish people, you know, here, well, Jewish Voice for Peace is one of the biggest. And in, in Buffalo, it's the one of the, I'm, I am part of Jewish Jewish Voice for Peace and proud to be part of it, proud to be a Jewish Voice for Peace in the synagogue as well. And people do thank me. Some people don't thank me, I'm sure. <laughs> um, they, but some people really do think and they're troubled. So, but then they can join Jewish Voice for Peace and join making our, raising our voices here. So, um, so let us go once more around, all the way around, um, about how people can help and get more involved. So I know, you know, a couple of things have been mentioned, but just to re-emphasize what those things are, um, Rob, and we'll just go back, you know, round circle um, again. I, I, if I could just go a, a little bit off script, I just want to say. Sure. Um, a difference between mobilization against this genocide and what uh, what we did, what activists were doing in the early 2000s in the uh, run up to the invasion of Iraq and, and Afghanistan is that there's so many more um, Muslim and Arab uh, Americans engaged and and fighting this. And back then, the Patriot Act and, and you know, all of those, um, you know, the the the. Not that you know Islamoph Islamophobic um, um, statements and and sentiments aren't spread uh, in in our country, but there are really engaged and organized uh, Arab and Muslim Americans much different from before. I feel, and it's really like growing the the, the anti war movement, and and it's in such an important voice of people who are have connections to the Middle East. Who, who um, you know, whose insights and experience can inform the activism, um, and who are doing amazing work. So I just want to say, like a, a silver lining difference. You know, we we mobilized against the Iraq War, and and you know, we were dismissed as an opinion poll. But with our the Muslim and Arab uh, American uh, like brothers and sisters, uh, you know, we have a much greater chance of getting accountability of st of stopping the slaughter and of of you know, stopping the occupation and um, stopping the expansion of the war. Um, so I just wanted to say that. Um, That's a but, great point. Thank you for that, Rob. Thank you. That yeah. is big and very important. Um, and, uh, you know, and also getting involved in your campaign, especially yeah. for people who are in, in uh, New York City, but also for, for the rest of us, we can come and or uh, go ahead. Well, well, Kathy Kelly, uh, you know, mentioned the uh, opportunity in World Beyond War to sign on to the petition and the the letters that are going to uh, UN uh, UN missions or foreign ministries. I'm I'm not sure who the exact target is, but it's other governments and the, or their representatives. Um, to and and if you're not in New York, that's an important, um, a really important action. Um, but in New York, you know, we are. Um, Code Pink, if you uh, look at Google Code Pink, ICJ resources, you can volunteer to um, help uh, organize delegations to key countries' missions and uh, let them know what you feel, what you've seen, uh, and what you what you want them to do. You know, we 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 de debrief afterwards, we prepare before, we have demands, but your voices, <clears throat> people's voices who, who would like to participate are, are welcome to help shape um, what the demands are and what these diplomats hear from just average Americans like myself who are, are um, trying to stop what's what's happening. Um, Thank so, you. Yeah. And it's so, it's so, you so well organized, so well done, so wonderful to be part of. I can vouch for that. Greg? Yeah, I, I mean, solidarity is everything, um, that we are up against the greatest powers <laughs> of the Western world, uh, the government of the United States, of the United Kingdom, Germany, the European Union. We are up against powerful and wealthy media 
corporations. Um, but um, when we're living in this Western bubble, where we see that, you know, we have neighbors that have no idea that there is a genocide happening in Palestine. We have um, uh, neighbors who are still believing the false stories and are not aware of the truth that has been happening. So that means we have a privilege, all of us on this call, all of us who are watching, we tend to be the people that are a bit more informed, and we have a responsibility to share that information to educate our, our neighbors and in educating them to mobilize them. Um, and I think that's a part of our, our obligation of, of solidarity as well. Um, we have to raise holy hell because right. the hope is that we are intimidated enough by the uh, repression that's happening in our own societies, by the way we are treated by the media, by the way we're treated by government officials, university administrators, uh, and others, the police, uh, who have all been working to silence us because we are a threat to this status quo of genocide and of apartheid. If all we had were the, the, the mouths of the government officials in this country and the reports of the corporate media in this country, they would be okay. No one would know about their crimes that we are paying for with American tax dollars, with American military support, with American economic support, with American intelligence support, with the use of the American veto, um, uh, with American uh, official propaganda at the podiums of the State Department and the White House and uh, and, and others. Um, so they would never know about the reality of what's happening. So we have an obligation to make sure that they do know. But we have on our side, we have the truth <laughs> on our side. We have, a, uh, as Rob says, a growing solidarity and a growing movement like we haven't seen in many, many uh, years to, to challenge this. And what you might not be aware of if you're in the U.S. or Canada or, or Europe is that we also have the overwhelming majority of people in the world on our side and most governments of the world are also on our side. So we just have to shake loose this false reality that's been imposed on people here, uh, uh, make sure that they know the truth and then make sure people are mobilized to stop the horrors that are being committed in our name. We can do that. And I'm going to suggest that people go to your website and share some of your writings and things. And Cassie, we're virtually out of time, but I'm just going to please give, give. Now, I know you said that the um, World Beyond War uh, website is another place where people can, it's very important to go to. And a last thought that you want to share. Well, a mantra of sorts um, for voices over the years was where you stand determines what you see. And I'm so impressed by friends of mine who are going over to the West Bank. Some are leaving this week. And um, tomorrow I'll meet a young woman from Notre Dame who uh, just got back. Uh, she's a university student. And I think when people come back with their testimony, it's important that we feature them. So I'm, I have a chance to talk with students at St. Olaf's tomorrow, but I said, let me give part of my time over to Grania Malone, who has just come back from the West Bank. And given what happened to the young uh, student from Seattle who was killed, it's a very brave step for people to take. But I think that that's one of the most important things we can do, to try to make plans to be alongside people who can't escape from the terrible, terrible suffering that's being um, every day intensified. So thank you for this time. And Craig, you can bet that I will check your website and listen to you. I'm so sorry to have missed this opportunity. Oh, I was looking forward to it. Vicki, one of these days. <laughs> yes. So thank you so much. We, uh, I couldn't express how grateful, how, how vital all of your loving work is. So thank you. This is Talking Peace. And together we've been Talking Peace in truth and love.